Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning at First Presbyterian Church, Cooperstown. Seeing all these people in our very small village this weekend has been very exciting. Of course, I thought they were all here to be here this morning. But alas, when I do talk about Cooperstown to people who don't live here, who maybe don't know much about it, I describe it as a pilgrimage destination. <laughs> because it is. And you can see that when you walk around with people wearing the jersey of their favorite player. This has been a hoped for trip. And today, this weekend, is a hoped for event as well. And although our pews are not filled with these pilgrims, we pray that their pilgrimage event is beautiful and meaningful. All are welcome here, of course, in Jesus' name, worshiping here in the building and those participating via live stream. We all come for different reasons, to find community, to hear God's word of love, to be nurtured, to nurture others, to seek comfort, maybe answers. However it is you come this day, you are welcome. If you are visiting today, we invite you to sign our guest book near the door as you leave, or there may be cards in your pews to fill out and put in the offering plate, so we can thank you for being uh, here today and keep in touch with you. I encourage you to look in your bulletin at all of the important announcements about things coming up. Um, in addition to, you probably heard about the extensive damage uh, from the tornado in Rome, New York, and the most recent update I've heard from the Presbytery has been that um, I can provide this to you. I only got it at, at the last minute, but one thing that the whole city of Rome is in need of are meals delivered, warm meals cooked and delivered every day. Um, so I can give you a contact information if you'd like to participate in that way. But there is also a link in your bulletin for um, other ways to volunteer. We certainly pray for First Presbyterian in Rome. Uh, their sanctuary was utterly destroyed. Um, as well as uh, Pastor Edwina's uh, manse um, and many other structures as well. Are there other announcements that need to be made today? John. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to thank Jim Leslie for providing the cones for our parking lot this, uh, this week. Um, um, so that, and I really like to thank Paul Myhan for uh, um, moving them for folks to come in this morning. Um, we are not having coffee hour today, so um, um, we are going to be using our parking lot for paid parking uh, for folks who are walk, uh, trying to find a space to get to the pilgrimage. Um, so um, so just, to, to, just to let you know, um, we, we are, we are going to be using for par for our uh, lot for paid parking today, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. In other words, we got to skedaddle as soon as worship's over, I think. <laughs> Carol. Good morning. This is our call to worship. Christ says, come away to a deserted place and rest a while. God calls us to quiet and rest, even as we continue to minister to those in need. Let us worship and find rest for our weary souls. Please join now in hymn 187, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. <laughs>
Join me now in the call to confession. Let us confess our sin, confident in God's love for us. God of green pastures, we confess that we can get so busy and distracted that we lose sight of your love and care for us. We forget to live in gratitude and fail to of goodness and mercy. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us down gentle paths that restore our souls. This is the Declaration of Forgiveness. Today we are reminded that we have been restored to the grace of God. Hostilities have been healed and we are forgiven. Therefore, let us share a sign of peace with one another, for this congregation is the feast that God has prepared for us this day. Amen. Please now we join you to share the, the peace in whatever way you feel comfortable. The peace of God be with you always. And also, also with you. you. This is the prayer for illumination. Holy One, may the reading of your word draw near to you those of us once far off. May the hearing of your word break down the dividing walls between us. For Jesus Christ, your living and active word is our peace. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 23, and it is our responsorial reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord, Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along the right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament scripture is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, 11, verses 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us, abolishing the law 
with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have the access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Please join now in him number 824, verses 1 and 2. There is a place of quiet rest. chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's sing the third verse of our hymn, 824.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Creator and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For Jesus Christ is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. In the biblical imagination, there are only two types of people. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. The Jewish people are those chosen by God through whom God will bless all nations. The people marked by God's covenant through circumcision, the people whom God approached with a special offer of salvation. And then there is everybody else. The Gentiles, also sometimes referred to as the nations, are the people who were not part of God's covenant. They are outsiders to what God has done in history. Israel and the nations, Jews and Gentiles, you're either one or the other. Israel is told by God early on not to mingle with the Gentiles so as not to adopt their ways so that they could remain a holy people set apart for God's purposes in the world. The ultimate purpose of this, though, is to bring salvation to the Gentiles as well. We hear that especially in Isaiah's prophecies. While there are instances in Scripture where this absolute boundary between Jew and Gentile becomes blurred, for the most part, the difference between them is absolute and insurmountable. Everybody falls into only one category, and everyone is either an insider or an outsider. In this morning's reading from Ephesians, Paul is addressing a group of Christians who mostly had been at one time outsiders. It's actually a pretty mixed congregation, and that's part of the problem. Can a Gentile become a Christian, or do they have to become Jewish first, undergo circumcision, follow the dietary laws, and so forth? How does this new movement work? when these two insurmountably different kinds of people are suddenly together. Paul speaks here to the Gentiles directly, and he's telling them how they are brought in to inherit the promises that God made for Israel. Paul reminds them in a not-so-gentle or subtle way that they were once aliens and strangers. They were once known as the uncircumcision. How's that for a playground nickname? (laughs) This is what signified inness or outness, a physical marker that all could see should they choose to look, but of course, only if you were male. Gentiles lacking this particular physical marker were completely without God in the world and without hope. They were far off, a non-people, like sheep without a shepherd, as we heard in the gospel today. And as a side note, when Jesus, in his compassion, compares these people flocking to him to sheep without a shepherd... He's not saying that these poor people are lacking a king or a leader or ruler, some sort of drill master to keep them all in order. He's saying they lack someone to give them the gospel, the news that they are loved and forgiven and freed from the strictures of the law because it has already been completely fulfilled in him. But Paul is also addressing a very problematic aspect of this relationship between Jews and Gentiles. There is hostility, there is enmity between the two groups. In a real way, not only are the Gentiles strangers to what God has done in Israel, but both groups are strangers to each other. Jews worshipped one God, Gentiles worshipped many. Jews held to an observance of the law. Gentiles knew of no such observances. 
This led to profound misunderstandings. It led to bloodshed and hostility between the two groups. Their differences seemed insurmountable and absolute. Now today, we don't think of everyone as either Jew or Gentile, but you know as well as I that we are just as talented at categorizing people into one thing or the other. There are Republicans and Democrats. There's the ruling class and the working class, liberals and conservatives, woke and unwoke, rural and urban, rich and poor, successful and unsuccessful. There are insiders and outsiders. These two are seemingly absolute and insurmountable, more and more so every day. There's no getting around them. And like the Jew-Gentile distinction, these categories lead us to hostility, a zero-sum game. If you're in the other category as I am, more success for you means less success for me. And I'm forced to see you as a threat to my well-being. We often imagine that the people living in the world inhabit two different humanities because it feels that way. We say it all the time. I feel like I live in a completely different universe from those people. But Paul offers us a very different vision about how things work. He writes, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He's made both groups into one. This is actually really strange and staggering language. Sometimes language in the Bible just kind of flies past us without thinking twice about it. We hear it so often. But this is scandalous. The Gentiles who were far off, who were unclean, who were untouchable, who were not part of the promise, they've been brought in very close. And now the wall of enmity has been broken down, despite all evidence to the contrary. Somehow, because of Jesus, because of this person who is also God. What's going on? Is Paul just saying that because of Jesus, we should put aside our differences and just get along? That we should all live into the dream and sing with John Lennon that we should give peace a chance? I don't think that's exactly what he's saying. Listen to how Paul continues this description of Christ's work. Christ has made one new humanity in place of the two. He has reconciled both groups to God in one body through the cross. Jesus has made a new humanity, but why the cross? Because of Jesus, all these divisions and these ultimate categories that we come up with to measure each other, measure ourselves against everybody, they don't mean anything in the end. But what does the cross have to do with it? How can the cross be our peace? Isn't the cross a symbol of violence and destruction and division? Yes, the cross was the way in which Rome dealt with everybody who was at the bottom of the ladder. The cross was the way in which Rome let everybody know who was boss. The cross was where petty thieves and robbers and insurrectionists were killed for all to see as a warning for all so they would behave, so they would inform on their neighbors or stay quiet. It's how all totalitarian regimes work. But the God who is greater than Caesar took that symbol of division and shame and made it into the tree of life with branches long and wide and strong enough for the whole world to find a home in. 
An instrument of cruel death became the seed of a new creation, one marked not by division, but by love. Peace is not what we think it is. Peace is not, for example, what we were told it is this week at the political theater in Milwaukee, which invoked peace achieved through raw aggression, power over, coercion. That's not peace. Nor is peace an escape from all the noise and commotion of the world. The word peace derives, of course, from the Hebrew word shalom, which has very specific signifiers and meanings. Forget everything you think you know about it from the way we use that word. First of all, like the Hawaiian word aloha, shalom is used to say hello and goodbye. It comes from a Hebrew root word that means wholeness. And what is wholeness? In the Hebraic way of thinking, wholeness is the joining together of opposites. That's why shalom is used to greet friends and to wish them farewell. In the most opposite of situations, coming and going, we use the same word, shalom. There's a hidden connection to all of our comings and goings. They are wondrously linked together. When we arrive somewhere, we're going on to someplace else. And when we realize this, we recognize our wholeness. And that is the source of peace. The knowledge that all of our opposing energies are somehow linked and part of a single whole. True peace must have wholeness at its foundation. Here's how one writer puts it. If I am a political left-winger, I am only flying with one wing. If I am a political right-winger, I am only flying with one wing. Yet it takes two wings for an eagle to fly. It takes the integration of two opposing positions for there to be real shalom. The word dialogue comes from the Greek dia logos, meaning across words or across reason or speech that goes back and forth. It's easy to have a left wing or a right wing peace rally with people who already agree with us, but this is not the wholeness that is implied in the word shalom. Shalom is the most radical union of opposites imaginable. It smashes our binary ways of thinking and responding to each other. Shalom brings together people who disagree wildly with each other so that each will listen deeply to the other side. It's the people you do not agree with who have the greatest gift for you, the gift of the potential for wholeness. This is what peace is. This writer, the one I quoted earlier, who is part of a Jewish, Christian, Muslim peace movement in the Middle East, continues by describing what this can be like. The peace movement I belong to is one of dialogue, tough dialogue, heart-wrenching dialogue, gentle dialogue, but always dialogue, speech that goes back and forth with each side constantly challenging, refining, and purifying the other until we recognize that the other is none other than a reflection of our own selves. Apart from the cross, the walls of hostility and enmity are indeed absolute. Apart from the fact that at the foot of that cross, the ground is level, when we are all equally beloved and forgiven, all are included and embraced. Apart from that, the hostility remains. The cross reveals how we are universally broken and universally loved. Our divisions, our hostility, those things are not absolute. 
Only the love of God in Christ Jesus is absolute. And at the cross, all of our identities, every single one, are found in the broken and crucified one, the one whose blood is poured out for us in an eternal act of love. Just as we were once enemies to each other, just as that person who's on the opposite side of the culture war as I am was once my enemy, we were both once enemies of God. But now we are no longer strangers to each other and we are no longer strangers to God. We belong to each other in ways that are messy and complicated and beautiful and necessary in ways that make us whole, not because we feel good, but because of Christ. In that beautiful, complicated mess of our belonging is our peace. Jesus is our peace and our wholeness, and he's come among us again today to give us himself, to make us one, to do what no government, no policy, no club, no association, no escape, no beautiful sunset can do to be our shalom, our wholeness. Amen. God spreads a table of blessing before us. Let us express our gratitude by giving a portion of what has been given to us. Let us pray. 
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us through this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Please be seated. I invite your joys and concerns for our time of prayer. Or online. Jess, you spoke a lot this morning about the cross, and I've been sitting here, and there has been a shaft of sunlight which has shone on our cross, mm -hmm. illuminating it right in front of, right behind where Hetty is, and it's been there all morning. Somehow or other, that has a meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, for those of you who remember Lizzie Williams, she posted on Facebook this morning that she turned 42 last week and she was at a event, um, a race. She likes to go to the races, um, car racing. And um, she had a 15 minute seizure while in the stands and is having trouble with uh, forgetfulness and a lot of anxiety. And so please pray for her. What's the, I'm sorry, I think it's Lizzie Williams. Lizzie, thank you. Uh, my joy is that not only do I have Sarah with me most of the time, but our son Tim and grandsons Chase and Jude visiting for a while too, which is wonderful. And my joy is to have my cousin, Sally Newhall, here. <laughs> and she is a retired Presbyterian minister, and her family has a long history in this church. So we are happy to have you. Welcome. If we're going down this road, I have my brother, John Carl, here, my mother, Mary, and son, my younger brother. Thanks. It's a joy to see all of our visitors who are coming for the Hall of Fame induction ceremony pausing to read our historic markers on the front lawn. Uh, there were a number of them out there this morning before church, and um, they had questions and paused to read them. John Davis, it's just such a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Marion and John Carl and Mary Livermore, I think, and maybe I don't know if there are other Carl family members here, but it's such a pleasure to have them here. Thank you for the sermon today. It is so necessary now. And I hope that there can be movement when Netanyahu comes this week to address Congress. I would also ask for prayers for Amina Razano, who had a stroke about a week ago, is recovering well, but is dealing with fatigue and terror and weakness, um, and for Katie, who has not been feeling well the last couple of days. I'd also ask, like to ask prayers for Sue. She's having surgery for kidney stones on Wednesday, so that's why she hasn't been here the last couple of weeks. Uh, so we're praying for her recovery. Thank you. Carol. 
I have a joy. My friend Bob um, from Poughkeepsie that had heart surgery a few weeks ago is home and doing well. And then uh, concern for um, Kate Leonardo who lost her husband, Jim. Um, he was a former oncologist at Bassett and he's been uh, suffering with cancer for quite some time and was home on hospice the last few days and he passed Friday, Friday night. Thank you. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. For the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. Heal the hostility between us and break down the dividing walls that keep us apart. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For the creation, cause new trees to be planted. Restrain the melting of polar ice caps. Save land from destruction. Like a shepherd tends her sheep, raise up from among us caretakers of all you have made. We pray for those who have been suffering in higher than normal temperatures, through droughts, through floods, and in damage wrought by hurricanes and tornadoes. We pray especially for the people of Rome, New York, and the surrounding area, for leaders and members of First Presbyterian in Rome, which was utterly destroyed. Give your saving help, your comfort, and your daily provision to all in need. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For the leaders of nations and heads of tribes, where peace seems far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. We pray for peace in Sudan, Venezuela, Ivory Coast, Ukraine, Haiti, Gaza in Israel, Iran, Pakistan, Lebanon. We pray for an end to gun violence in this country and healing for those who believe it to be the only way to deal with pain and suffering. In your mercy, hear our prayer. For the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors, heal those who are sick, give courage to all who struggle with addiction, touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain, provide Sabbath rest to the overworked and renewal to those who lie awake at night with fearful or anxious thoughts. We pray especially for Amina, Gerda, Tanet, Adrian, the Lasky family, Nancy, Lizzie, Katie, Sue, Kate, and all others in our minds and hearts this day. In your mercy, O oh God, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the many joys of this life. We give you thanks for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries, for those gatherings with families or friends. Especially we give thanks for those visiting us today, for Sally Newhall, for Tim and Chase and Jude, for John, for all who have visitors coming this week and for all who have arrived for this special Hall of Fame induction weekend. And we give thanks that we have historical markers in front of our church that describe part of our history and our passion for others to read and wonder about and learn from. We give thanks that Bob's surgery went well and we pray for his continued recovery. We give thanks for our interdependence with the Presbytery of Utica and with our ecumenical partners. We give thanks that the Medical Debt Fulfillment Report shows that the Utica Presbytery campaign to help with overdue medical debt reached over $2.6 million, helping lift the burden of debt 
in nearly 2,000 cases throughout New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. <clears throat> Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory and proclaim the great mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Join together as one by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are bold to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All is now ready. Come to taste and see that the Lord is good. We'll start from Robin. And John, you can start your side.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Please join me in the post-communion prayer. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we sing our closing hymn, 744, Arise, Your Light Has Come. restored in the worship of our God. The Holy Spirit has built us into a living temple for the Savior. Have no fear, for God is with us. Let us go out with joy and be God's banquet for a hungry world. Amen. Amen.